of the uh, Foreign Language Department. And I would like to welcome all of you students, friends, and colleagues participating in the seventh Encuentro of Ibero American Writers at Queensborough Community College. I would like to say a few words today about the Encuentro and today's program. For the past seven years, several of my colleagues in the Foreign Language Department, led by Dr. Laura Sabani, organized a series of cross disciplinary conferences that have, explored, uh, that have explored different aspects related to the cultures of Latin American, Latin American Spain, including literature, literary criticism, music, and art. The topic that they've chosen for today's encuentro, literature and exile, will certainly resonate with many people in the audience today. We live in Queens, the most diverse county, county in the country. And we work and study at QCC, a college where many faculty members, including our president, Dr. Marti, and almost half of the students uh, were born in another country and speak a language other than English at home. Many of us in this room have, have experienced exile firsthand or through people we're close to. Some of us had to leave our countries for political or economic reasons. Others simply chose to live elsewhere. No matter the reason for our exile, at times we all have experienced both the sense of displacement and the excitement of discovery. And the most creative among us have been able to express this emotion in an artistic form. Our guest speaker today, Thomas Merma and Eduardo Bolago, <coughs> Uh, will discuss how their lives and their work have been shaped by the condition of exile. And I know many of us will identify with some of their experiences. But before we proceed with our program, Dr. Lorena, Lorena Ellis would like to say a few words. Please welcome Dr. Ellis. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. I would like to thank uh, speakers for the gener generosity of their time in coming here. I would like to also thank the uh, committee, the organizing committee, and I would like to uh, I'll call the names. I would like them to stand up so you can be recognized. Uh, under the leadership of Laura Sabani, where is Laura? She's probably behind the scenes somewhere. Uh, Professor Ortiz Griffin, Laura is in the back. Professor Ortiz Griffin is over there. Professor Madrigal, right here up front, and Professor Eladia Raya is in class, or all the way in the back there. Okay, good. Eladia. <laughs> <laughs> I come from Brazil, and I am living in, uh, in a voluntary exile for the last three decades. I was wondering, I'm sure a lot of you come from different countries. What countries, how many people here come from a country different from the United States? Let's see some hands here. All right, all right, good. So, you will see that today's uh, topic, Literature in, in Exile, will not only expand your minds, but also your hearts, because you're going to feel what they're talking about. Be before I, uh, I introduce my colleague who will introduce the speakers, I would like to say a few words, and that is mention two names. Uh, you all received this little, our program, and in the program there are a few very important authors that you probably all recognize and know. But I would like to mention two that I feel are very much tied to the Ibero-American uh, culture. One is a Spanish missionary called José de Anchieta. He is considered the founder of the Brazilian theater. He's a Spanish missionary. He went to Brazil in the 16th century, and he stayed there forever. He also wrote a grammar in the Tupi language so he could communicate with the Indians. And, the, and the, he's considered the founder of the Brazilian theater. And the other person I would like to mention is also, like you have on your program, you have a German called Thomas Mann. This other person is called Bertolt Brecht, and he's also very important in the Ibero-American theater. He is one of the three Bs that we, uh, some people believe, are the 
founders of the new Latin American theater. One B is for Brecht, the other one is for a Brazilian called Bual, and the third is for another Colombian person called Buenaventura. The three together are considered the biggest influence in the new Latin American theater. And uh, we are going to continue this topic and this conversation in the spring in Queens College with, uh, in collaboration with Nora Glickman, who's right here in this thing, and other colleagues from CUNY. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Luis Maligal, who will introduce the speaker. Good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you uh, Thomas Normal first. Uh, Thomas Normal is uh, a man of letters who is both an educator and an accomplished writer. He's also my friend. Thomas Normal is an emeritus professor at CUNY, a professor who has devoted his academic uh, career, his academic life, to better understand and explain the Spanish thought of the 20th century. His books and publications on Unamuno, Ortega Gasset, and other Spanish thinkers are well known among specialists and students alike. The rhetoric of humanism, uh, just to mention one of his most important books, is a penetrating analysis on the different approaches and rhetorical devices used by both conservative and leftist writers during Franco's regime. Thomas Normal has also studied uh, very carefully the Spanish essay since the 18th century to the present day. I guess that his familiarity to the writings of Feijó, Lar, Uno, which beloved Ortega said, has influenced and somehow this right. Thomas Normal is a sure, an important scholar and a refined critic. But the reason why he's here today with us is because of his personal writing. In the last years, after a time, Thomas Normal has devoted his time to write his own memoirs. His memoirs, by the way, published uh, next year, and I already know that the, the prologue is going to be by probably the most uh, known uh, novelist uh, in Spain. I would say that a writer obviously needs talent to his work, but also needs something to say. Tom's life, I will use the first name, as he's my dear friend. Tom's life belongs to the staff where not only dreams, but nightmares are made of. Born in Hungary, two years shy of the outbreak of uh, the Second World War, in a Jewish family, he Miraculously escaped death at the hands of the Nazis, thanks to the cunning of his father and the generosity and courage of a farmer who hid both child and father for a few months in his house. As he will tell you much better than me, after the war, he entered a world without a mother, since she was killed in Auschwitz, but a stepmother who, to say the least, was just a stepmother to him, and without a country. Or rather, belonging to several countries in the span of five or six years. Russia, Czechoslovakia, Chile, and finally the United States. But of those uh, experiences as a refugee and how he coped uh, with loss and displacement, we will talk to you now. Thank 
thank you, Professor Madrigal, for those generous and touching remarks that you've made about me. Uh, that only really a friend can extend with such emotion and feeling. Thank you. Thank you for Queensborough, to Queensborough for inviting me here. Uh, I've titled my talk, Survivor, Refugee, Emigrant. I just want to start off by saying that like many Americans, like many of you here, uh, I have a multiple identity. Uh, I'm an Americanized Hungarian Jew with brief, very minimal exposures to post-war Soviet and Czech society and to a long immersion a long, lifelong immersion in, uh, in Spanish culture. At the core of my personal history is the legacy of Judaism, uh, strongly marked by my survival of the uh, Holocaust, which Professor Madrigal mentioned briefly. Uh, in 1944, the, the Nazis marched into Hungary and proceeded to exterminate nearly a half a million Jews. But my father and I survived because of this man uh, who was willing to sacrifice uh, his, his life, that of his wife, and, and five children. Uh, that's, that's no small feat because uh, you can try to imagine somebody taking that kind of a risk. Uh, ask yourself if you would could ever be capable of doing something like that. Not to mention the fact that he never accepted any payment, which after the war he could have received. Uh, he didn't want anything before. He didn't want anything after. Uh, he risked his life. He, he took us into the woods. He brought us food. When things got too dangerous in the woods, he took us to his house. He put us up in his hayloft until the war ended, until we uh, were liberated by the, uh, by the Red Army, by the, by the Russians. Uh, my mother was not so fortunate. She, she died in the camps, but I, I can't go into that now. It's, it's a very long and painful story. Um, Sounds like those cannons from the Russians when they were coming. <laughs> yeah. um, in 1948, uh, right after the war, we, uh, we moved around Eastern Europe for a while. So I first went to Russian school for about three weeks. And then uh, my father's first plan was to stay in there and repay the Russians for what they have done for us and help him rebuild uh, society, but uh, communism was not much to his liking, and we started to move uh, westward, so I didn't stay in Russian school too long. I went to Czech school for about a year and a half, and then we emigrated to Chile, where I learned Spanish, and then eventually to the United States. So uh, my life is a palimpsest of different cult cultures where historical events and as well as personal decisions have helped to shape my identity. I'm a survivor, I'm a refugee, I'm an emigrant. But let's start with my origins first, which are in themselves very, very complicated. I was born in an area of Eastern Europe which was suffused with three different cultures, Hungarian, Czechoslovak, and Ruthenian. You probably haven't heard what a Ruthenian is, or a Carpathian. You may have heard of the Carpathian Mountains. It's a little area uh, in western Ukraine. Uh, some, it's called uh, Subcarpathian Russia. It's part of Russia, it's part of Ukraine. But the interesting thing is that uh, it constantly changed borders. So sometimes you were under Hungarian occupation, sometimes under Czech. Now it's Russian, now it's Ukrainian to be exact. So uh, as a child, I heard uh, Hungarian, I heard Ruthenian, I heard uh, Yiddish. And uh, then, as I said, after the war, I went to Russian school, I went to Czech school. In Chile, at the age of 10, I learned Spanish, and then I went briefly to Hebrew school. Uh, I forgot my Czech, and I forgot my Hebrew uh, almost completely. 
I was born in a territory which was historically Hungarian, but the year I was born there, it was Czech. Hungarian is my mother tongue, and I spoke it with my parents. I lived in Hungary my first six years, but never attended Hungarian school, nor was I socialized in Hungarian beyond the home. Nor did I live long enough in Chile to become a Chilean. I did finally become an American with all the above cultural and linguistic baggage that I just mentioned. The phenomenon of multiple identities, which I have and some of you have, I'm sure, is very complex and even paradoxical. Um, how one lives, for example, their Judaism or any other religion is a highly personal matter, but how one lives it socially is another matter. It depends on time and place. If you are a French Jew, it makes a very, if, if, if you are a French Jew, it makes a very big difference whether you are living under Napoleon, who gave Jews citizenships and rights, or under the Vichy government that sent them to their deaths. Or whether you lived in relatively tolerant medieval Spain, or during the time of the Catholic kings. So let's look at my core identity, that of a Hungarian Jew. Hungarians are historically, historically no less anti-Semitic than other Central Europeans. Although for a variety of reasons, they were reluctant to hand over their Jews to Hitler to the very end, up until the very end, and this only when Nazi Germany just marched in and took over Hungary. And yet most Hungarians would not recognize Jews as bona fide Hungarians, even as most Jews would feel so and claim that they are Hungarians first, they would show more most, in, most enthusiastic patriotism and defend their country with their lives. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, before World War II, the, um, any Hungarian Jew that was not of a small shtetl type of uh, origin would say that he's Hungarian first and, uh, and a Jew second, or he called himself a Hungarian of the Mosaic faith. And also there was an extremely high rate of assimilation before World War II of Hungarians who, who would convert or who would just stop feeling their Judaism very, very strongly. But anyway, the Hungarians would not accept, especially those who were very nationalistic, would not accept uh, the Jews as being Hungarians. And the same thing with Russians or Poles, those who had these very nationalistic tendencies. There were many of them. So this um, non-acceptance by Hungarians uh, of their own Jews uh, led the Hungarian Jewish novelist George Conrad to write a memoir with the title, A Stranger in My Own Country. And that's pretty much how I felt when I went back to Hungary for the first time. I, I spoke the language, but I certainly didn't identify at all with the society. Um, um, when I started to speak Hungarian, which I speak with a vocabulary of a 15-year-old, you know, they very soon realized that there was something lacking in recognizing me as a complete Hungarian. Uh, the same thing happens kind of with, with Spanish. Uh, if I'm in Spain, and I think Spanish is the only language I speak without an, any accent, it's a universal Spanish. And in Spain, immediately people know I'm not from Spain, they think I'm from Argentina. Um, uh, so uh, in spite of my long uh, exposure to, uh, to Spanish culture, you can tell a Spaniard or any uh, one even in South America will eventually detect that there's something foreign about me. And the same thing with American. If you listen to my English, you will detect a very slight accent, which is not quite American. So uh, uh, this is not a, a, a complaint of any kind. It's just a reality that I cannot call one particular culture as absolutely, absolutely my own. Uh, but there's one thing that runs through uh, all of these identities, and that would be my, my Judaism. But what kind of Jew am I anyway? There's no way I can look at, hear, or pronounce that word without a sense of unease. 
and lingering paranoia. I still feel fear rejection, ostracism, even prosecution. Jew sounds to me like a curse in every language I know. I remember the Hungarian epithet, Buddha Jido, stinking Jew, an insult I heard in childhood, and it feels like a, still feels like a stab. For me, a Jewish identity has been a source of fear, shame, and embarrassment, but also of privilege, defiance, pride, and even snobbery. There are times I wish I wasn't one, and that the tribe would just assimilate into humankind. At other times, I'm glad we have remained a distinct people for over 5,000 years. But what kind of Jew am I anyway? I don't really know. I do know that I was born and raised a Jew, was a target for murder for being one, had a bar mitzvah, went to Hebrew school for one year in Chile, and observed, for more social than religious reasons, the rituals of Passover. At the Seder, when we read about the Israelites, Israelites' flight from Pharaoh, I always remember our escape from the Nazis and our miraculous survival. On our highest holiday of Yom Kippur, I fast meditate and sometimes read passages from the Old Testament or from texts by Jewish sages. On the anniversary of my father's death, a yard site, I light a candle and say the obligatory prayer, the Kaddish. I am woefully ignorant of Jewish history and customs. I have many Jewish friends. I support, but by no means uncritically, Israel, and I believe in a two-state solution to its bitter enmity with Palestinians. I remain awed, baffled, stupefied by the methods and magnitude of the Shoah, but I am fully aware that people other than Jews have been victims of persecution and genocide. I do not accept victimhood as part of my identity and find Jewish clannishness reprehensible. I never did suffer, nor do I suffer now from survivor guilt, although I often wonder for what purpose, if any, I have been spared from Nazi extermination. In my native town, my four-year-old playmate, Tibby, and thousands like her were not spared. Until I understand why, I will not recognize God's ways and will always question his existence, but not too much. There are times I do believe I was chosen, saved, but these feelings are inevitably followed by rational rejection. In moments of detachment and lucidity, I consider myself an agnostic. What keeps me an agnostic is the fundamental question formulated by both the philosophers Leibniz and Heidegger. Why is there something rather than nothing? If a supreme intelligence created the universe, then either he, she, it left it up to us to discover its meaning, or there is a purpose, a design embedded in the codes of nature or in the dogmas and mysteries of religion or in our spiritual constitution. I don't know, and that's why I'm an agnostic. Sometimes impelled more by whimsical curiosity than existential anguish, I think of God as the deist did, a being who wound up the universe like a clock and walked away. But whatever the nature of this supreme being, if there is one, to accept the idea that he intervened personally to save me would be morally outrageous. So I waver. Am I special, or is it that in the human affairs, luck, chance, and coincidence shape our destiny. Who knows? Weights at the moment in Spain. 
Eduardo, I can say, is also an old friend of mine, a very good friend. And although, as the saying goes, familiarity may breed uh, contempt, <laughs> this is certainly not my case. Because the more I know him, the more I appreciate him as a writer. I have known Eduardo for more than 20 years, and I have had the opportunity and the privilege to witness at close range how committed and serious it is in regard to the art and the craft of writing. A writer is much more than a person who writes to a person who publishes books. Historians and scientists publish books. Celebrities of all sorts publish books. Nowadays, uh, everyone, uh, almost everyone, practically everyone can post and publish online. Those who write, they publish and sell, can be regarded as authors, but not necessarily as writers. A writer is something else. Eduardo told me a few months ago that when he was uh, in France on tour promoting the translation of one of his novels, a publisher, a French publisher, uh, came to him and after congratulating him for his novel, said, who said on every bar, you are a writer. As if by uttering these words, he was offering to him the best and ultimate compliment. In fact, a writer is primarily a literary man, a man devoted to the craft of words, and also if he is really serious and committed, a man or a woman in search of some truth. A truth that can only be found and revealed through words. Now, the challenge that every true writer has is to find a particular and original voice to express that truth. A voice and not an echo. A voice that will transcend the voices and echoes of the tribe. Today, and how we are reflecting on the theme of exile in literature. Exile literally means banishment from one's country, usually due to political reasons. Obi, Dante, Victor Hugo, Miguel Namuno, just to say the thing, some of the big ones, suffer banishment from their own lands because of political reasons. But exile, as such, in literature, has a much broader meaning. For a true writer, experiencing exile, that is, separation from his own roots, from his culture, to put a distance from your own land and your words, is almost an obligation. A writer cannot be too close to his own land if he really wants to portray and evoke this land with a clear, honest, <coughs> and distinctive voice. Eduardo, I'm sure we'll talk about this in a moment. Now, just let me finish by telling you that Eduardo Lago has published uh, uh, two important novels in the last uh, four years, Llamame Brooklyn, Call Me Brooklyn, and Ladron de Mapas. Llamame Brooklyn was an instant success received uh, several prestigious awards, including the Nadal in 2009, 
2006. This is perhaps the most important, one of the most important literary awards in the Spanish world. The novel has also been translated in 14 or 15 languages. Yamame Brooklyn, in many ways, is a lyrical reflection on displacement, both spiritual and physical displacement. As the protagonist uh, is an American living in Brooklyn, quite the title. Born in Spain during the Civil War, who, among other things, would have to cope throughout his life with the horrors brought by this terrible country. But uh, let Eduardo Lago now take uh, the floor. Right? Well, thank you, Jose Luis. I cannot call him Professor Madrigal because I don't know him for so long. And I'm also a friend and a colleague of uh, uh, Thomas McMiles. And uh, I'm very happy to be here because for a long time I taught uh, in the CUNY system. I graduated from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And I've taught at many of the colleges, like Brooklyn College or City College. And I recognize, I recognize the audience uh, in you today. So thank you to the authorities also here. And uh, I think that in situations like this, the most interesting thing is to have a conversation towards the end. If you have questions, or I would ask the moderator, Professor Madrigal, to perhaps conduct some questions directed to, to both of us today. Uh, I am going to tell a very different story. Uh, I'm going to reflect on exile, on politics, uh, but I, I am a particular kind of writer because um, there's something I don't like about the writers, which is that they are always talking about themselves and uh, they think that they are, very, they are very important and they are promoting their books and they want to sell books. And this is something that has nothing to do with the true vocation of a writer. And uh, it's very easy to find uh, successful writers who have no talent whatsoever, just, you know, good publicity behind and marketing and commercial, you know, agents doing all these things. And this is the reason why I never wanted to publish. And uh, as a matter of fact, apart from a few very minor things, I published my first novel when I was 50 already. And uh, it is the result of serious reflections. So I think that fundamentally, uh, true artists, and I am not saying that I am one, tend to be, or should be, or are, selfless people who tend to efface themselves, like Vincent van Gogh, who was totally unknown when he died, or speaking about painters like Vermeer, the Dutch painter, whose wife had to sell an oil painting to the baker so after his death so that she could feed her family. Nowadays, the paintings by Vermeer or Rothko, to name another person who also was quite uh, selfless. Well, this is part of the story about um, one of my main obsessions, which is the huge distance between the realm of true art in every way and other scenarios like marketing or publishing houses, etc., etc. Um, so I'm not too interested in talking about myself today, and uh, I'm more interested in talking about a number of things that are going around all of us here. One of them is the fate of Spanish language. And in, in that regard, I can associate myself with some uh, form of exile, or 
journey undertaken by by the Spanish language. And uh, I'm not a victim of anything. I have not uh, been subject to any kind of persecution. I didn't have to escape my country for economic reasons or for political reasons because although I had to live and endure a dictatorship, that of Franco, which was the beginning of the rise of fascism in Europe, that was the first chapter. And this is already part of the trajectory I want to, to talk about today, of the language also. So this is already the first chapter of the improvised novel that we can have here today. The rise of fascism starts in Spain in 1936. And what, what is it? And the second chapter is Italy, where the name fascism becomes solid. And then the third chapter is the Third Reich, the Nazis. When in democratic Spain in the 30s, there is a general who subverts the legal order and expels the, the politicians with his army, a war begins. But it's not a national war in Spain. It's a universal war. And everybody goes to Spain to fight fascism. Many people from New York, many people from the United States, from England, many people from Brooklyn, from France, from all countries, they, they go and fight uh, the fascist forces of, of Franco. And this is connected with the origin of my own novel. In terms of the history of the language, something extraordinary is happening now, nowadays, with the Spanish language. Spanish is born in Castile. That is why in many countries it's called Castilian. And it travels over to the side of the Atlantic in 1492. And it becomes, little by little, after three centuries of colony, the, the property, the spiritual property of 22 nations in Latin America. And that is what makes Spanish language great these days. It makes it a, the second most important, the second most global language. But this motion of the language from Europe to first South and Central America and now, what we are witnessing today, and this is very important, and there are many Latinos here in the audience, Spanish begins to push forth towards the north, north of the Rio Grande. And nowadays, Spanish is the second language of the United States. And it is alive, and approximately a quarter of the population speaks Spanish here in this country. I was, as a director of Instituto Cervantes, talking about this fact the other day in a conference, and they reminded me, and I said, I think that the center of gravity has traveled from Spain to Latin America, and now slowly into the United States. And now I'm going to say a couple of facts or data that are really important. One of, it, it, it's the following. At some moment of the 21st century, the country with the largest numbers of Spanish speakers is going to be the United States of America, more than any other country, including Mexico. At this point, it is the third. There are more speakers than in Spain at this point. And, but the, we have to do analysis with the Latino population, because among them, uh, there are many who lose the language or do not retain it. And this is a very long story. But this is the history I wanted to talk about today, the trajectory of the language. And with the language goes along the culture. Now, I do not know well why I came to the United States, but I was not very comfortable with my own country in Spain. And what happened to me is something similar to what happened to the language is that I, I feel I feel that I experienced a kind of rebirth in a real way. I became, again, a person. I began anew here in the United States. And that is when 
although I had always written since I was eight years old without any intention of publishing, I began to write in a different manner. When I arrived in New York City, there's a very special energy in this town, in this huge city, that I had to do something with that. I have to say that we writers do not choose to write. We have to do it. Otherwise, we die. We, it, it's something that is inside us, and if we don't take it out, we would die. We have to do something with that energy. The same thing with painters, the same thing with musicians, any kind of art, artist has the same, not problem, it's a good problem to have. You have something that it is superior to you and that you have to shape artistically, and this entails a very strong discipline. So when I arrived in New York City, and I knew the city very well because my first job, I'd, although I didn't come as an immigrant, I didn't, I didn't have the intention to stay. A series of factors determined that I finally would stay. But one of the first jobs was in a, in a high school in Brooklyn, in a vocational and technical high school. And there's no better or tougher introduction to the city. I could mm, really know the lives of the students very well. And I could see the fabric of the whole city, not from Manhattan, which is central, but, but more from Brooklyn. And I began to write. I, I like to write standing and in lectures like this. I remember finding places in the school where I could write because I had to take note of everything that I was seeing day after day. And first, I had a series of notebooks where I put all the experiences of what I was witnessing. It was the lives of the students. The, I'll tell you a story that comes to my mind right now. A student would come to me and would say to me, uh, Mr. Lago, I'm sorry I couldn't come to class yesterday because my sister had an accident and she was burned alive. And I, said, and I needed time to assimilate such a thing. And then there were many stories like that, strong experiences. Many of them had to do with drugs in the case of the students and very tough stories in the city, incredible ones. And I was patiently taking note of everything as a witness because I felt, and I continue to do that, that I had to do something with that. Along the years, without intention of publishing anyway, I began to ask myself why I was not publishing, and I, de I decided to take all these um, dispersed materials, and I began to shape them into a novel. And I have to tell you that I have interviewed many of the best North American writers. Uh, the greatest ones, some of them are already dead, like Norman Mailer and, and others. But uh, I, there's something that will always stay with me from a great North American writer, Philip Roth. Uh, when I interviewed him, he had already written a large number of books, over 25. And he said to me, because I always ask about the process of writing and what happens and where do you go. And he said to me, you know, this is not fun. I've been writing all my life because I feel that I have to do it, but I do not derive too much pleasure from it. He had just published American Pastoral, which is a masterpiece. And um, he said, well, maybe the last three books, I'm beginning to see some kind of compensation in terms of being more at ease with himself. But really, as in the case of Kafka, for example, the many other writers, writing is associated with some kind of suffering, including exile, which is not my case, because exile cannot be voluntary. If it is voluntary, it's not exile. It's something is else. It doesn't count to me. Exile is when you are forced to leave Africa because you're starving and you want to go to Europe. And it's a terrible journey because Europe doesn't want to accept Africans. They control the situation and they die trying to cross the Straits of Gibraltar every day. That's exile. Exile is when Latin Americans try to cross the border and, and, and share the richness of this country. And then there are also many kinds of problems and laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That, those are forms of exile, but that is not my case, I have to say. I cannot claim something that is not the case. So 
I wanted to say that there are two types of suffering associated with writing, and that is why many people who have a huge talent choose not to write. Another uh, example is another great writer, Don DeLillo, born in the Bronx in, in New York. I also interviewed him, and I was speaking with him once, and he, and he was very nice to me after the interview. He said, well, let's get together for lunch, and we did that. So I would call him occasionally, and then I realized that I was intruding somehow. And uh, he explained to me why. He said, you know, I have, I do not have so many years to live, and I want to finish all the things that I feel that I should write. It sounds like a terrible condition to have to deal with that. This, uh, Philip Roth said the same thing to me. He, live, he lives in a cottage in Westchester, and he goes there, and, he, and every day of his life, he writes for hours and hours and hours on end, because he has this inside, and he has to take it out for human, fellow, fellow human beings. And um, these two examples made me think the second, a lot. The second type of suffering is technical. Um, writing is extremely difficult. This is part of what Professor Madrigal was mentioning about my vocation. Uh, you, you can spend, like another good friend of mine, Juno Diaz, whom I translated many years ago before he became famous with the second book. I translated uh, Drown as Negocios. Uh, and um, all these three writers will tell you, um, before him, James Joyce, or that you may spend six hours writing, and maybe you will have one or two paragraphs, perhaps, or maybe less, or you can have a good day also, but uh, it is a technical suffering because the duty of the writer, and I go back to Van Gogh, the painter in this case, is that you cannot leave things as they were before you. You have to do something new. You have to invent form because content never changes because we always write about the same things, which are the profoundest things, the feelings that we all human beings have. And only some of us know how to deal with. So you have to do this for others. You have to do it in a, in a consciously difficult way. It is a technical struggle that the reader does not notice. When they read your page, they, they cannot see through all the suffering that goes behind that. Same thing for Rothko, when you see what he achieves in his paintings. Rothko is very important for me as an example, and there is a chapter devoted to him in Call Me Brooklyn. Uh, that easy-looking canvases are the result of many hours of technical suffering. So I will go on to one more example, which is the great poet Czeslav Milos, who lived in exile, in real exile in the United States for 50 years. First a victim of the Nazis, then of the Soviets, then he went to Berkeley, and then I interviewed him when he went back to Poland, to the beautiful city of Krakow. And uh, it's a privilege to have conversations with these great writers. So I asked him the fundamental question. I asked him, he said he was a poet. And I said, how is a poem born? And he said, I don't know. It is given to me. And I said, by whom? And he said, I don't know. I don't name him, he said, which is a very religious way of approaching that. And I am not a religious person. What I think about poets is that of all kinds of writers, they constitute the superior kind because they have to deal with the most difficult aspects of language or linguistic expression in any language. And uh, they are above the rest. They are almost on the same level as, as music, which is an, an utter mystery. In the car on the way here, we were having a discussion about non-verbal realities. And uh, I leave you with two artistic forms that have the privilege of eliminating words. And this is music, which somehow is a narrative form, but without words, 
or painting, why do we experience an almost religious emotion when we when we contemplate a painting by Velázquez or Van Gogh or Vermeer or Rothko? Who can explain that? Who can explain our feeling? And about poets and about poetry, poets are superior beings because they do really not know exactly what is going on inside them, but they are not doing it for themselves. They are doing that for the rest of us. They see what we cannot see. William Blake would go to the forest and come back home and would say to his wife, while I was in the forest, an angel came to me and dictated this poem. If somebody says that to you, you take them to the mental asylum right away. But he produced some of the most beautiful poetry in the English language. Or the German composer Schumann, exactly the same thing. An angel, he claimed, he claimed, detected some melodies to him, and then he composed them, and we could listen to them. Like we can listen to the mystery of Beethoven's last compositions. When he was approaching death, he already felt that. And this closeness to death made him compose these extraordinary last quartets uh, of his last days of life. Also, when I visited uh, Milos, he gave me the manuscript of a poem, which was called, it's now published in English, uh, he wrote in Polish only. It was called The Second Space. And it was the experience of somebody who already was feeling, he was 92, what death was like. What is on the other side? Do we know, as Professor Mermal was asking, if there is a God? Why is there something rather than nothing? Who knows? We don't know. Nobody knows. People may have religious beliefs, but and it's absolutely respectable and wonderful, but what do we know? Well, poets know some things that others do not know, they see for us. And that is why you, readers, when you read poems or novels, identify with the great authors because they manage to explain what is happening to you. They manage to explain your feelings of loss, your feelings of faith or belief or disbelief, of pain. Those things we go through every day in life are the things that writers and painters and musicians deal with and uh, that's why it's a very difficult subject matter. My novel came as a response to somebody who had arrived in this country. I spent uh, like 15 years uh, taking notes together, putting notes together and then I shaped them into a, a novel that I called uh, Call Me Brooklyn and then for reasons beyond my grasp because that, that is not what I was seeking. It had a huge success, which I had not anticipated at all. And that somehow changed uh, my life. I would like to say something about my trajectory as a critic, as a professor, and also as the director of Instituto Cervantes. And it has to do also with the, with the Spanish language. And it is my huge interest in Latino literature and what is going on in this country with Latino writers. And Latino writers interest me a lot, and I want to go back to one idea where I connect with exile, and this is what Czeslav Miller said to me. He said, I don't know what, what country I belong to. The only country for a writer is his language, which is the reason why he always wrote in his original Polish language, although he lived here for, for such a long time. And I, I, I identify with that. People ask me, why don't you write in English? Well, I could, uh, but uh, I, it's impossible for me. I would feel that I would be betraying something very profound. But I am lucky because Spanish is not a foreign language in the United States. It has never been mind the names, Los Angeles. 
you know who California was? California was a queen in the chivalry novels of the 16th century. And uh, when the conquistadors arrived here, they saw America through the lens of the chivalry novels they were reading, all these fantasies. They, they, they did not see reality. They saw it through the, through the lens of literature. So that's the idea of the, of the language being the only possible country for somebody like me here, although I have, I have the two countries in my heart, the United States and Spain, Spain and, and the United States. And my total interest lies with the Latinos of the United States and how they are reshaping in very profound ways this country. And many of them, like Juno Diaz, who is a good friend, or Oscar Ijuelos, who is also a good friend, and who won the Pulitzer Prize 18 years before Juno Diaz with the Mambo Kings play Songs of Love. These writers and many others that I teach at Sarah Lawrence lost their language. But within their writings, Spanish is throbbing, shaping the prose, not only in the words and phrases interspersed with the, with the rest of the prose. And I think that uh, mm, there are many minorities in this country, but the Latino minority is really changing the face of the United States. And I am very interested in studying what is going on with the Spanish language in the United State, uh, States. It was my idea uh, to produce an encyclopedia of, of Spanish in the United States. I have one last idea that I would say in connection with this, is that one day, a, a professor came to see me, and I had just received a book which was Encyclopedia of Spanish in the World. And I showed it to Professor Lopez Morales, who taught many years here. He said, do you see this book, Humberto? He said, yeah, great book, wonderful. And he said, have you seen what it says about the United States? I said, yeah, I, I have, of course. And he said, well, open the book and have a look at it. He said, oh, yeah, Professor Marcos Marin, he's my friend. He wrote it, yeah, great. And he said, how many pages is that? And he said, I don't know, count them, said, 12. They wanted to explain what is going on with the Spanish in this country in 12 pages. He looked at me and he said, well, how come nobody ever thought of that before? 18 months later, he had published, together with a group of uh, 80 specialists, a volume which is 1,200 pages long, and it is the Encyclopedia of Spanish in the United States. But there's one thing, which is the following. Nobody in the Anglo world knows about this. Over 600 articles written about this encyclopedia in the Spanish media, and there is a very serious imbalance between the Spanish-speaking world in the United States and the English-speaking world. And that is that Spanish language and culture continue to be associated with poverty, with second-rate citizens, and things like that, even in the realm of culture. So without any kind of anger at all on my part, because I don't think it is the case, and it, it's pointless, I think there's a lot to do in regard to the situation of the Spanish in the United States. So my exile was voluntary, therefore not an exile, but it produced in me a novel, and for that I am very grateful to this great country because it's a novel that connects the, my two countries. And I have to say that, and I go back to the very beginning of, of this uh, talk, when, I, when one writes, like, like I said about the poets, one does not know where he or she is going. You are in the dark. You are following something. It's like when Miguel Angel, the sculptor, had a cube of marble in front of him. Only he saw inside that Moses or the Virgin. And he extracted that divine forms from the block of marble. Same thing with writers, same thing with poets. You're in the dark, but you don't know very well where you're going. And as I was writing on my novel in a very unconscious way, 
I did not know that I was trying to find the connection between the two countries, and the connection I found not only in the greatness of the fact of the, the journey of the language becoming the United States is going to be, as I said, and I want to emphasize the idea because it's very important, the country with the largest number of speakers of Spanish in the world this century, in a few decades from now, and that is very important. What I found is that the moment where I could connect Spain and the United States is when men and women from this country, men and women from the city of New York, men and women from the borough of Brooklyn went to Spain to fight fascism. And then in this difficult process of writing the novel, I discovered that the protagonist of the novel was an orphan of the Civil War. He is born in Madrid in the middle of the, an attack on, from the fascists. The mother dies giving birth to him. There's an American brigadier who is waiting for, he's helping her, and when he, the daughter comes out, he says, the child is okay, but the mother has died. And so, so the American and his wife adopt him and bring him to Brooklyn, and from that fact, I could create my novel. And these are my thoughts about literature and exile, and thank you. Should we take questions? Yeah, we still have a few minutes for questions. I would like to, I said that the gal is more than a rating, but I would like to just finish off something that I've completely forgotten why I mentioned Bertolt Brecht, because like Bertolt Brecht, in a way, reflects both these gentlemen. Um, Thomas Merma went through different countries in exile, and Brecht also, his books were burned by the Nazis, 33. Next day, he took his Jewish wife, and they traveled to a lot of countries. He was in exile for 14 years, and he even said, I changed my countries more often than I should change my shoes. <laughs> and he, he did write, of course, poetry, and as you say, uh, as you know, playwright he was. But, um, uh, and he also, in exile, wrote, I think, one of your most important uh, plays. So you mentioned uh, your country is your language, and that's why you write in Spanish. So my question is, how uh, directly are you involved with the translation of your text into the English language? Okay, but my language, my book is, has been translated into 12 languages, but not into English. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Which, which is the, the subject for a, another lecture. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why not? It's, it's a no, it, it's a very, very long story, and, uh, and um, I would rather not go into that because it, every day they ask me this question, and I have to answer it every day, so I'm a little bit tired. It's a, it, it's a very long question, it's a very long answer. You could write a book of fun. <laughs> it wouldn't be published, yeah, <laughs> in English. So, but I can tell you from the other side, which is the following. Uh, many of my translators write to me, and it's really incredible, the, question, the kind of questions I get, because they notice things that I have no idea, especially mistakes, very interesting mistakes that you make. I'll tell you a little anecdote. One day, in my novel, there's a moment which is taken from truth, from reality, which is that I was with a friend from Spain, a painter, and he had his studio somewhere in Chinatown. And he said to me, he was saying to me, do you hear the story of the people who live in the tunnels of New York under the, the surface? Uh, he said, yeah, 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 but you know, do you think it's true? And he said, yeah, it's true here, you know, sometimes. And he was telling this when a huge metal slab opened in front of us in a very short, a uh, black woman uh, took somebody out and said, well, okay, so see you later. What time are you coming back? And then it closed again. So this I, I, I incorporated in, into my novel. And then I tried to bring my friends to the same place, and I never found it. 
until my Italian translator said to me, the location of, of that place is wrong because it, you say that it's in the intersection of this and that street which never cross each other. <laughs> so thanks to her, I could find where it, it was exactly. Um, in the case of Juno Diaz, whom I translated into English, into Spanish, he would call me and he would say, do you have any questions? I said, no. Uh, can I help you somehow? He said, no. I don't need you, but uh, I want to make sure that everything is fine. But I don't need you because it has to. I know what you mean to say, and I can say that in Spanish. I don't need you. Are there other questions? Chile, okay. Uh, uh, after the war, my father had a brother who had come out before the war in 1921. Actually, I was, it's a very interesting man because he was part of the uh, communist revolution in Hungary in 1920 that failed, and he was associated with a communist leader called Bela Kun. He was very close to him. And after that communist revolution failed, he was sentenced to death. He came to the United States and became very wealthy and influential. So after the war, he brought out all the surviving brothers that were left. And uh, we had our visa number, but the number was very high, and we were afraid that we will not be able to get out from the Iron Curtain. So we decided to wait for our number in Chile, where my stepmother had a relative. So that's, that's the way it could have been any country. Could have been any. Thank you. Other questions? We're also almost out of time because the next. Uh, so thank you very much. Let's hear a round of applause.